You're listening to Carly Gallagher, naturopath and hormone specialist. This is Help by Hormones, helping you to address hormone dysfunction naturally. Sit back, relax and enjoy today's episode. Hi everyone and welcome to Help My Hormones. I'm really excited to be sharing this episode with you today. I have a breast implant illness expert, Sarah Filippi, joining me from America. And uh, she is um, passionate about restoring health that has taken her on a journey from being a registered nurse to becoming a certified functional diagnostic nutrition practitioner, also a true cellular detox practitioner and a breast implant illness expert. She believes the solution to reversing breast implant illness is about more than just the explant and that we all need to take personal responsibility for restoring our health by addressing all of the root causes that contribute to chronic illness. It is Sarah's belief that the body has an innate desire to heal if given what it needs and she focuses on teaching women how to unlock that innate intelligence and to heal themselves. True words from an expert. I really love <laughs> listening to all that you have to share. And it'd be great if you could take people on that journey that you've been through in particular around breast implant illness and how that's impacted your hormones. Sure. Thank you so much for having me on your show, Carly. And I'm just so you know happy to be sharing this information with your audience. It's just a really important topic. Um, to cover because there are millions of women who receive breast implants every year for a variety of reasons. Um, so unfortunately, there's just you know not a lot of information out there, and so many women are just simply unaware of the dangers associated with them. And so with with so many women getting breast implants every single year, they really have the potential to impact a significant amount you know number of women. So it's really becoming an epidemic, and that's what we're starting to see. Um, so they've actually been referred to as the ticking time bomb, and that really does explain the risk associated with having those in your body. Um, and so a lot of women will experience, you know, vague symptoms that don't really seem to be connected to any one particular condition, and oftentimes they get mi misdiagnosed. Um, and so people will present with things like chronic fatigue, um, chronic uh, cognitive dysfunction, so things like brain fog, difficulty concentrating, poor word retrieval, memory issues, and things like muscle aches and pains and joint pain and hair loss and weight gain, um, low libido, ringing in the ears, heart palpitations, shortness of breath, anxiety, depression. It's just the list continues to go on and on and on, and so it's hard to really connect the dots. And not everyone who has breast implants gets sick right away like I did. Some women, you know, may have them for decades with no issues, and then eventually things start crumbling. So as far as my own story and how I became involved with this is, you know, through my personal experience, um, my own personal journey really became a pain to purpose for me. Um, and so it was, I would say my journey really, my story, I would say really started when I was young, um, a young girl, maybe the age of 10, and really just feeling, um, like I, I, I learned through experience that breasts were really important. And it was because, and I, it was a pivotal moment in my life, and I remember it as if it were yesterday. I remember a very important person in my life said to me, you're gonna be 4'11", just like me, referring to my height, <laughs> but don't worry, you're gonna have the Johnson boobs. And so for me, in my young, impressionable mind, that meant I need to worry if I don't have big breasts. Yeah. That, that was a really important part of being a woman and that I should feel, you know, not great about myself if I didn't have that. And so it, it fueled this desire um, as I grew and as I matured and didn't grow large breasts. Um, and I ended up, you know, stuffing my bra and trying to make myself look a certain way. And so I had this desire from an early, early age because of that experience. And so fast forward many, many years down the road, you know, I got really into fitness and I just wanted to get in the best physical shape of my life. And I was about 30 years old. And so kind of along with that desire came my breast augmentation because it was really all about the appearance rather than health. So, you know, my diet was very poor. I was putting my body through a lot of stress. I was working night shift at a busy hospital. 
So I kind of just had this, this culmination of a perfect storm set up. So all of these different things kind of set me up for the fall and the trigger was my breast implants. Yeah. And so within about six months of having my breast implants placed, I started noticing lots of symptoms like I already discussed. So um, insomnia, lots of hair loss, fatigue, um, irritability, um, menstrual problems, um, bloating, gas, all of these different things that I couldn't really explain. And I thought, well, maybe, you know, if I just get off night shift off, out of the hospital, then I'll feel better. So I got off night shift and nothing changed. And so I started seeking help from medical doctors. Um, and of course, no one could help me. Um, and so this kind of took me down a path, down a rabbit hole of really like digging and looking for what could potentially be the root cause of all of this. Because I knew in my mind that I had been healthy my entire life, or maybe I wasn't healthy, but I didn't have any symptoms. Yeah. That's a big distinguishing um, yeah. factor there. <laughs> Um, and so I knew my body couldn't possibly just all of a sudden turn on me for no reason. Yeah. And so, yeah, that's kind of where, where my search started and what yeah. led me down that path. I, I, I think the, um, similarity with your case and, uh, cases of thyroid patients of my own is yeah. that they start with all these crazy symptoms that weren't there before. And they don't actually marry up with a typical, oh, well, it's this. You just mm -hmm. can't put your finger on it. It's so erratic uh, all over the place. And, um, and I think that's where people get confused and uh, find it challenging to find the right practitioner because they're, they're maybe looking down a, a pathway and not yeah. thinking big picture and not really thinking it's something that's inside them that yeah. they got it. Yeah. And no one ever asked me if I had breast implants. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> no one has asked people. And yeah. how did you then come to that realization that, oh, it might be yeah. there? Well, you know, when I was kind of doing a lot of research, I, I had this kind of this hunch, this intuition that it might be my breast implants early on within the first year. And I couldn't trust it because there just was no information online. There were no studies. There was nobody talking about it. I even looked on like blogs, like forums, different places like that, where I, I thought maybe some women are talking about this. Nobody was talking about it. So I couldn't just go off of a hunch or, or like this intuition. And so I continued on this path of just like lab work and, you know, going from practitioner to practitioner, trying to figure out what's wrong with me and how I can fix my broken body. Um, because I was literally just miserable. I, my whole life was an absolute wreck. I was unable to function, unable to be a normal human being and connect with other people on the same level that I used to. Um, because it was just so uncomfortable living in my body. Um, and so I finally did get diagnosed with a lot of different things. So Hashimoto's was the first, which I had suspected right from the get-go. Yeah. And it took me a while to get someone to acknowledge that and, and, and diagnose me with that. Um, and then, you know, it, it went down that path of more testing. And so I discovered I had chronic Lyme disease. I had you know, candida overgrowth, despite SIBO, um, which is small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Um, I had discovered much, much later that I had stage four endometriosis. Um, there was so much dysfunction in my body that no wonder I felt terrible. Yeah. And I just couldn't quite figure out what it was. And so as I kind of went along, years passed by and I continued down this path of doing all this work on myself and it got to a point where I had actually improved quite a bit with the work that I had done. I was about maybe 50% better, but I couldn't get pregnant. And we really wanted to start a family. And we had already been trying for a couple of years with no success. And so it, was, it came to that point where it wasn't really even about me anymore. Um, it was more about the thought of 
you know, what if, what if my breast implants are the root cause and they're contributing to all this toxicity in my body? And what if I were to get pregnant? You know, how would I impact a growing baby inside of me? And how is that going to impact that child's health and future health um, down the road? And so it was, it was more about that aspect than even about my own physical health. So I, once I made that decision, um, it was within a few months I had gotten them removed. Yeah. It was just, it took me a long time to get to a place where I could just believe and have faith that that instinct and intuition that I originally had was correct and willing to make that leap of faith and get them out because it's a really aggressive surgery and it's a, it's a long journey, a long healing journey. Um, so I wanted to be sure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And like your your um, implants, they were obviously the newer um, model. They uh, were saline. No, so mine were silicone gel. Silicone gel, yep. Sorry, not saline. Um, and so, you know, your research would have been pretty sound going into getting them. Um, what what was your what is your gut, you know, there's not a lot of research unless yeah. you can share, um, you know, what is your kind of uh, theory on what is happening with, uh, within the body that's creating this perfect storm, you know? Yeah. Um, do, you, do you kind of have a hunch, like why the body is becoming so dysregulated because of the implants? Yeah. So, you know, anytime we put a foreign material into the body, there's the potential for problems to arise and breast implants are, an, are no exception to that. So issues can develop from both silicone and saline. It doesn't really matter which kind you have due to, you know, the chemicals that are in them, the heavy metals that are in them, um, in the silicone and the shell of the saline implants and the fact that they can harbor and, and grow um, bacteria and mold and other types of fungus and kind of act as a petri dish and that can really impact the immune system and cause a lot of inflammatory response in the body. Yeah. Um, so you know I always tell people that breast implants are a problem in a couple of ways. So a physical, they're a physical stressor because they're a foreign object and they are stimulating the immune system. You know the immune system goes to work from day one when you when you have breast implants placed. It goes to work initially creating a capsule around them to wall them off because your body knows that they don't belong there. So they're trying to protect you. It's trying to protect you by walling them off with the capsule. So that's basically like fibrous scar tissue. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, your immune system then also recruits all kinds of different inflammatory cytokines, providing a, an environment that microorganisms can really thrive. And what we've discovered or what some surgeons are discovering upon um, explant and doing you know some um, culture of the fluid around the implants is that there's 12 plus different microorganisms found between the capsule and the implant um, so we know this is a problem yeah. um, and they're also a chemical stressor you know i refer to them as the chemical soup because there are 37 different toxic heavy metals and chemicals within silicone breast implants and then you also have some some toxins found in the, the shell of saline, um, but saline pose a little bit different problem. So in silicone, you have, you know, things like, um, you know, methyl ethyl ketone and um, um, mercury and tin and lead and all those different things. And there's lots of different neurotoxic, cytotoxic, carcinogenic chemicals, um, even printing ink. I mean, what is printing ink doing in an implant? <laughs> <laughs> and that's in so, the itself or within the, the breast um, capsule? Within the implant itself, yeah. yeah. And is that, um, normal? like, why would they develop something with so, is it must be for the structure and the ability? Mm -hmm. of yeah, it must be for the structure. Um, I don't have an answer for why, why, you know. <laughs> that's my question too. <laughs> I think we're all wondering that. <laughs> And like, with, um, I'm interested to know a little bit about um, your conversations that you had with your surgeon who removed the breast. Was it the same surgeon who put them in? No, no. Um, in general, I don't usually recommend that 
a person go to the same surgeon that placed them to get them removed because it really does require extra special skill and training to be able to remove them properly. So I can talk about the proper explant procedure if you would like me to. Oh yeah, that'd be great. I'm sure people okay. would be very interested. Yeah, so it's really important to find someone, a surgeon who has done lots, I'm talking hundreds, at least <laughs> hundreds of explant surgeries because you know, this is a part of your body that is super close to your, your lungs and your heart. It's right over your heart. So you wanna be really careful. Um, the implants are best removed, best practice is having them removed on block, um, which means the capsule around the implants and the implants are removed as one unit together. So they, they're not cut open, the capsule is not cut open. And the reason is because when you cut open the capsule, which most surgeons do when they're removing implants yeah. in general, um, is you risk if there's a rupture, especially with silicone, because with silicone, you, you don't know if there's a rupture until you get in there because it's cohesive gel. So it stays in place. Um, so if you were to cut it open, you risk you know, all of that silicone and toxic materials just getting right into all that dense lymphatic tissue and traveling throughout the body. Yeah. Um, and you don't want that. <laughs> so on block is preferred and ideal. And then um, going back and removing every little speck of capsule that's in that chest cavity is really important as well because that capsule will also contain um, different contaminants from the breast implants and, you know, harbor inflammatory um, cytokines and bacteria and viruses and things like that. And that will continue to fuel the immune response. Um, and inflammation. And so I've talked with women who have had their implants removed, but the capsule was not removed and they are still sick yeah. um, because that capsule does contain a lot of that toxicity and, you know, microbes. So um, if, if you can't have them removed on block, then the next best scenario is to um, have the complete capsulectomy. So the entire capsule removed after the implant is removed. But either way, all of the capsule needs to come out. And that requires a lot of skill because if, especially if they're placed under the muscle, they're usually stuck to the rib cage. And it requires um, you know, scraping of the ribs or sometimes even cautery can work to get that um, capsule removed from the rib cage. But that there's just really, really thin layer of tissue between in the intercostal space where, you know, between the ribs. Yeah. and where your lungs are. So the risk is puncturing the lungs. So someone needs to be very, very skilled in that process. I never, I, I didn't know that. I really didn't understand, um, didn't know that with an explant, that they would actually leave the capsule in there or they wouldn't take the whole thing out. So that's really yeah. interesting. And I can now really appreciate the complexity in finding mm -hmm. the right surgeon to do that because... Um, you don't want anything left in there. You know, right. it, we, you know, my feeling is this is, is definitely in the bucket of what we classify as chronic inflammatory response syndrome, which is, absolutely, a, you know, a biotoxin um, uh, exposure. So we're talking about people who live in a mouldy house, for example, mm -hmm. you're getting this, you know, connections to Lyme and lupus and autoimmune conditions, left, right and centre. And you know how sick those people are who are susceptible to mould in particular. You know, mm -hmm. people, you know, you, you've got to get them out of that environment. You, you know, you've got to throw all your shoes out, your couches out, your beds mm -hmm. out. If you leave a bit of capsule in your, you know, chest, you're not really, you know, getting rid of that um, exposure. So um, that's really... Um, you know, important for people to, to know that it's, uh, I think it's hard enough to come to the decision to get the explant in the first mm -hmm. place. I think that's where I'm seeing a lot of, you know, my patients are that, you know, maybe they can just get better if they treat the symptoms. And um, unfortunately, in your particular case, you went through that journey and, yeah. you know, you had to come to the realisation a couple of years down the track after a lot of obviously commitment. What type of alternative um, therapies did you uh, find the most beneficial for you, you know, prior to explant and post explant, um, the importance of it? Yeah, so first of all, I just wanna say in response to your 
comment about the biotoxin, the chronic inflammatory response um, syndrome and biotoxin illness. And saline implants are a huge source of biotoxin illness because they have a one-way valve. And that valve is only supposed to go in one direction, but oftentimes it becomes dysfunctional or maybe it was damaged you know, before it was ever planted in a person's body. Um, and so mold and fungus and different bacteria can actually get inside that implant. And that is basically a Petri dish for these things to start growing and thriving. And, and if somebody needs to get out of a moldy home, imagine, imagine like just it living in you and you not being able to escape that environment. It's constantly just, you know, bleeding into your body and that's chronic biotoxin exposure. Yeah. So that can make people very, very sick. So, okay. Now, going back to your question, remind me, because now I lost my train of thought. <laughs> what alternative um, oh, yes. you know, things did you do prior to explant and after explant that were really important for your, I guess, uh, you know, getting to, to mm -hmm. where you are now, which is healthy and, you know, helping other people? Yeah, so I, I did rely on, you know, almost all of my, you know, the things that I did for myself were ho holistic and natural um, I, I really didn't rely on medical, on um, um, modern medicine for much. Um, so for me, you know, it was all about initially the foundation. So, you know, the right kind of diet, anti-inflammatory kind of diet, um, the right kind of exercise for me and my given, you know, physical state, um, you know, making sure that my digestion was well supported and I was absorbing nutrients and getting the nutrients that I, you know, was lacking, um, making sure I was sleeping really well and doing some basic, you know, supportive things, drinking clean water, getting rid of toxic products in the home, you know, toxic skincare and personal care and hair care and cleaning products and all of that. Um, so we really, you know, removing the breast implants is just kind of that it's, it can be part of the first step, which is removing the source, but there are so many other sources to consider as well. Um, and so that was kind of where I started. And then I did a lot of gut work and dealing with chronic infections because the things that really create chronic illness in today's world are toxicity and infections and then different types of traumas. Um, and from my perspective, these types of things can come together to create a perfect storm. Just maybe the body was handling these things just fine up into a point where something was the straw that broke the camel's back. Um, and that ends up being the trigger for someone. Um, yeah. So it could be breast implants, it could be mold, it could be, you know, pathogens that cause Lyme, it can be, you know, a physical or, or um, mental emotional stressor, whatever it is at that point, the body's already on its way down. And yeah. so we need to work on removing all of the different types of stress. And so that's what I worked on is infections and then detox work. So really removing toxins from my body while I was removing the, the sources that were coming in. Yes. Um, and then working on my mindset and you know um, my mental emotional health and doing lots of meditation and deep breathing and repairing my, my, my you know, CNS really, my central nervous system. Yeah. Um, so that does take a lot of effort and work, but it's well worth it because the result of that is restoring your health and your body is so intelligent. And if given, like I always say, if given the right tools, it will get back to normal function. Yeah. So. Yeah. And I think um, you touched on a really um, important part of that process, which was starting really um, one, uh, I call it removing the burden and burden can come from anywhere. It can be an emotional burden. It can be an environmental burden. Mm -hmm. um, it's what we put in our mouth. It's what we put on our, in our skin or on our skin. Um, and so going through systematically looking at your whole environment and saying, hey, if I'm going to remove the explants, I've actually got to remove all the things around me as well that's creating mm -hmm. the burden. And then the body has the ability then to heal because it's, it's not trying to battle all these little fires around the place. And that dysbiosis that occurs in the gut, that all those infections, the small intestinal bacterial overgrowth and the yeast overgrowth and things like that, you know, can be removed so that the, you get the best, you know, ecosystem to, you know, support the immune system to now pick up. And so you've, you've started that journey through the gut, which is amazing. And then you've detoxed mm -hmm. all of those things out of your body. How long did it take you to, from say, explant to, where you feel like you were on top of things 
from a symptom point of view and an emotional point of view? You know, I would say, you know, my journey is a little bit different um, because I needed a second surgery after that explant. Um, you know, there was so much damage done from endometriosis that I needed to have excision surgery, which involves going in and having a laparoscopy and having those um, endometriomas or endometrial tissue that are outside of the uterus where they don't belong um, removed. Um, which was causing a lot of symptoms for me and was really making it impossible for me to get well. Was that on your um, colon, like we, where there's adhesions? Yeah. Yeah, on the colon, yeah. Yeah, and so I had to have a bowel resection and, you know, one of my fallopian tubes and, and one of, not my ovary, my ovary is still there, but one of my fallopian tubes removed and, you know, part of my vaginal wall cut out. And there was just a lot, it was just everywhere. It was an eight hour surgery. And he, my surgeon said it was the worst he's ever seen. Um, so I was- Do you feel that to, or oh, there's a connection, do you feel like this? Yeah, I yeah. think there's a connection because there's so much inflammation, you know, and all of that toxicity and the, um, the infections and the inflammation that goes along with that fuels autoimmunity and um, estrogen dominance and things like that. So that was a huge part of what I was dealing with. Yeah. So one, you know, I had my explant and then six months later I had the excision surgery. And then about six months after that, I started feeling fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> so overall it was about a year, a year for me. I, like I said, though, I had done a lot of that foundational work prior to explant, which I think really set me up for a, a nice recovery. Yeah. And I think that's, um, you know, a good segue into, you know, what would your advice be to those listeners out there that are suffering similar um, symptoms and conditions, uh, especially all of my Hashimoto and thyroid uh, patients out there? What would your advice be to them around, um, you know, making, making the right decision for them? Yeah, I would say if you've um, been swimming upstream like I was for many years and you haven't seen progress and you have breast implants, my, my hope is through sharing my story is that women will get it and the light bulb will come on and they won't wait like I did. Because I waited so long, there was so much damage to my body that was irreversible. And I had to have surgery, you know, again, <laughs> and remove body parts, yeah. uh, which is never what you want. Um, that's, that's just the, the worst case scenario, having to remove body parts. Um, so don't wait, you know, um, part of living a holistic and healthful lifestyle doesn't involve things like breast implants and Botox and injections. You know, it involves embracing who you are and loving your body the way it was designed and there are ways you can um you know support um the aging process naturally without going to those lengths and there are other ways that you can do breast you know enhancement without implants if that's something that you just feel you absolutely have to have um, but for me this process was really um it was really amazing for me mentally and emotionally and really learning to accept and love myself yeah. um, for, who, for who I am and love my body, you know, the way it was designed because we were designed perfectly and everyone is beautiful. And so hopefully, you know, um, women out there who are really struggling can come to terms with that and learn to love and accept themselves for who they are. An amazing end to that chat. I love how you ended with, um, bringing back to self-love and I think a lot of women out there where we're caring for a lot of other people in our lives instead of um, looking inwards and um, appreciating the value that we have uh, in society and also to our families and that we should probably place, place a bit more importance on ourselves. So yeah. I really um, thank you for sharing your jo uh, journey with us today, Sarah. And um, of course, all of your information is in the show notes. So for those people who want to reach out to Sarah mm -hmm. and check out her website, just got a wealth of information there um, around everything hormonal, um, as well as her journey um, in discovering uh, how to help others, other people with breast implant illness. And um, again, thank you for joining me. And 
I look forward to maybe having a chat with you in the future about some of these yeah. other things that you, you do, which is also amazing. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate you having me on, Carly. And I just hope that this really impacts some women's lives that really need to hear it. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>